Welcome back, crew, and thank you for joining us for the mechanics episode of the Coyote and Crow system, which is our May game of the month. Today, we're going to be diving into the mechanics of the system, showing you a bit of how it's actually played, uh, just so you can kind of get a feel for the system, seeing some of the different aspects, and, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to bring it to your crew and know a little bit more about how it actually is run before you actually get those dice rolling. But before we dive into that, one thing I do want to shout out is tomorrow, May 31st, is our actual play game of the Coyote and Crow system on uh, my channel, Tegan J Gaming at twitch.com. There'll be a link in the description, so join us. Uh, if you don't already follow me on the channel, follow us uh, outside of the game of the months. We've got some great content on there. But tomorrow is all about Coyote and Crow. We're going to be playing that at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, but one of the cool things, too, is we're going to be going through the encounter included in the book, uh, which is Encounter at Station 54, uh, which will hopefully be a good one-shot size. Uh, so to give you a little bit of a preview of the system, what it can do uh, with one of their pre-approved adventures. So join us for that. And not only are we running that adventure live, we're also going to be giving away a copy of the Coyote and Crow PDF. So if you didn't want to see me and my crew play an awesome new system, Join for your chance to win, uh, because we'll be raffling that off to one of the lucky participants in the channel. All you have to do is come and enter to win, and maybe uh, you'll be blessed and get the, the gift of the system you can bring back to your crew uh, and tell some amazing stories along with that Coyote and Crow system. So join us 7 p.m. tomorrow, Tuesday, May 31st, Tegan J Gaming, link in the descriptions, uh, and we'll have some fun, have a few laughs. Play an amazing system, and maybe you'll be the lucky winner. But before we do that, we need to dive into the mechanics of the Coyote and Crow system. So this video, I wanted to go over some of the core things, at least the things that stood out to me, uh, that were important for the system, just so we can kind of touch on them uh, and help me prepare for DMing it tomorrow, uh, and our story guiding it tomorrow, I should say, uh, and help anybody who's interested in the system afterwards get a little bit of a base point for jumping in. So there's a couple of big categories uh, that we're really going to hit pretty hard when it comes to the system. Uh, one of the first being that we want to touch on uh, just how dice are handled. So the system's a little bit different than most. Uh, not different than most, but just different. Uh, and they use a D12 system. I have to grab one of my D12s. Uh, and we're going to go how through how the dice are handled, the dice pool, some of the terminology there, uh, and just kind of make it confident when you have to roll a skill check, a weapon attack, a ability roll, whatever it may be for the system, you'll know how to roll them, how to calculate them, and how to determine the results. So we'll get into that. But we'll also go over how to handle encounters, how to handle damages, short rest, just a lot of the more crunchy aspects of the system, just uh, to make sure that when you get in the game, get ready to play, that you're comfortable with how everything's handled. So let, let, let's dive in. We're going to hit the ground running, uh, and we're going to touch on how dice checks are handled with the system. Uh, so biggest thing here so dice checks so this is anytime you're called for an ability check a skill roll uh a stat roll and let's just let's determine what those categories are so abilities uh those are gonna be different powers or things that you have uh that can be called into play uh and call for a stat roll uh like for instance when we made uh Thuy Pina, uh we gave him uh one of the strength abilities uh where he could increase his strength score but he had to roll will to be able to do it successfully uh, so for that one, you'd roll a will using your will ability power or your will stats. Uh, that would be your dice pool there. So abilities, kind of, they will call for it. They'll always make sure that you, uh, they'll, in the ability itself, it'll tell you what stats or what ability or what skills you need to roll to utilize the ability. And then you'll use that for your dice pools. Now for skills, these ones are very easy. For skill dice pool, it's always going to be equal to uh, the ranks or the, the, the ranks you have in that skill and the highest of the two ability scores linked to that skill. Uh, so it gives you some options there. And as I said before, the character build, I love that they have two abilities linked to each skill. Kind of makes it more build versatility. That's, uh, that's a cool idea. There's, I wish, uh, as I said, I came from 5e before, and I wish that was something that 5e may consider because sometimes you want to be a religious cleric uh, but don't want to specialize in it. This is a way to do that, but that's off the point. Uh, so you get to choose, if you have ranks in it, choose that highest one, uh, and then add the corresponding stat into the ranks of your skill, and then you roll your dice pools. And then for stats, those ones are going to only be called for when the GM calls for it. Uh, so those are going to be typically like a 
saving throw, for lack of a better word. That's not a word this system used, but just one that's commonly known. Uh, like rocks are falling. Uh, you need to make a strength check to see if you can uh, barricade yourself against the, uh, the, the mountain wall and uh, keep yourself from falling off. Similar. So those are the three reasons you're going to roll a dice pool. But what is a dice pool? So let's get into that. So we've already touched on it. We've actually kind of already given away the, the goat on this one. Uh, so the dice pool can be the number of dice that you roll, which is equivalent to the number of points you have in a certain category. So let's do skills because those will be what's most often ro rolled. Uh, so let's say for that athletics check we were just talking about, uh, you've got five ranks in athletics and you've got a three strength. So you would roll eight dice, eight D12 dice. So... A lot of times, especially if you're a D&D player, even a Pathfinder player, D12s got to sit on the get a little dust covered on them. This system, you're going to be busting out more D12s than you ever knew you needed. Uh, so you'd roll those eight D12s, and that's the first part of it. After that, so that's the dice pool. We've determined how you get that dice pool. Let's move into determining success. So with this system, success is typically going to be determined uh, by... Uh, so it's usually going to be... At base level, it's an eight. So uh, it's always going to... So if the DM or the story guide, I should say, doesn't change the success number, the default is eight. So eight or higher is a success. Seven or below is a failure. Easy. Uh, but the, D, uh, the story guide does have the ability to change that, though they recommend keeping it between, I think, five uh, and 11. Uh, just so it can't go lower than five because usually it's going to be a gimme at that point or higher than 11 because that's going to be... You have to get crit success just to be successful. So, with that, there's four. When you're determining the success, up uh, there's four different categories that a dice can be rolled into. So, uh, let's go over the easy ones. So, the success number or higher, so eight or above, is one category. Seven or below is another category. Now, there's two different ones for crit fails as well as crit successes. So, crit fail, nat one. That's a crit fail. That's going to add a failure, which is going to go into, which is different than being below the success number. It adds one failure into the system. And what that failure means is each time you roll a one, you're going to subtract one from the number of successes that you have, uh, as well as certain abilities will not function uh, or will not be uh, able to re-roll those ones. So just kind of a heads up on that side. Now on this side, you get 12s. Those are crit successes. They've got a fun system for that, too, uh, which uh, we'll get into a little bit later that you can actually use on that side. So we've got our dice. We know our successes. We roll the dice. We begin calculating those up, adding up our successes, our failures, and all of that. No, there's another thing. We're not going to touch on the legendary status. Uh, that one's usually going to... You have to have a legendary rank, uh, which most kind of new players for the system aren't going to have that. You're not going to start with that. Uh, that's like your story guide gives out. So we're not going to touch all that much. But we're going to go to the next area, though, using focus. So focus, that's going to be your mind stat. Uh, so which mind is uh, made up of uh, a couple of different stats. Uh, and it could... Usually it can be determined by your mental damage. Uh, so mind is uh, equal to your intelligence, wisdom, and perception, uh, all boiled into one. Uh, it usually can be done for mental damage, but one of the nice things with having that mind stat is you can use it for focus. And what focus will allow you to do is you can spend focus points to re-roll dice. So let's say if you've got a couple of or a couple of ones that were below the success number, you could go in and say, hey, if you got three that are below the success number, you really need this check to go well. You could spend those focus points taking them from your mental stats, so you minus them out, to re-roll those dice. Now, one caveat, you can't re-roll ones. So if you did get a crit failure on that, that just has to stay. Nothing you can really do there. So uh, a little bit of a take up on that side, but it does give you the option to burn some of those resources to really make sure that a roll that has to be a success is a success, which is cool. Always love uh, systems that give you a little bit more options just uh, to really make those big moments matter. After you roll those focus dice, you get to go in and roll critical dice. So this system, I said I like that. And I wish I put this in the first impressions, but this is, I like exploding dice or dice you get to keep rolling more dice. So any 12 that you get, and with the system too, I forgot to mention, so a lot of us play online nowadays, but if you do play in person, they recommend that you have, I think it was 12 D12 dice. 12 D, yeah, okay, it probably is 12. Uh, but nine of them being uh, white dice 
three of them being black dice. The nine white dice are just regular dice. The three black dice represent critical dice. So with the critical system, what happens here is anytime that you roll a 12, you gotta set those 12s aside. Those already count as a success, but the nice thing is anytime you get those 12s, you get to roll those black dice. And for the number of 12s you get, you get to roll a number equal to that number of black dice. Cool thing with these is even if you roll below the success number with those critical dice, they count at least as one success. If you roll above those numbers, it counts as two successes. And if you roll a 12 again, you can just get to keep rolling, which is pretty sick in my mind. So if you get on the hot streak, you can just keep rolling 12s, roll a 12s, roll a 12s, uh, and just ridiculously succeed on whatever you're hoping to do. Cool thing with this as well is certain gear and abilities have like a, a critical option, so like an effect that takes place when you crit, and which would be applied when you get a 12 on there. Also, they recommend if your gear or whatever you're doing doesn't have that critical success option, that the story guide kind of takes that into account and adds something above and beyond for achieving that critical success. So that's cool there. It gives you some cool narrative features and some different effects you can apply with your gear, as well as a story guide, some more levers they can pull to help push you along in the story that you guys are telling together. Uh, sweet, so now we've gone over that. The biggest piece left is to determine success or failure. Uh, so with this, there's three different ways, categories you can go into. So if you've got at least one success, you're at least partially successful. So in, remember, a success is at least the whatever that success number or above. So typically, eight or above. If you have one of those, you're at least partially successful. If you've got zero, that's a failure. If you have less than zero, and remember how you get less than zero is you get those nat one failures and they minus from your success total, that's gonna be a crit failure. So success, you've at least partially achieved what you wanted to go after. Uh, with the story guide kind of achieved, making you more and more successful, the more that you success dice that you got. So it's one of those ones that kind of stacks up. The more dice, success dice you got, the better that you'd have done with the role that you're going after. Uh, and failure, you kind of partially, you, were, you failed at your objective, but nothing was really lost. So it was one that uh, you didn't get what you wanted, but nothing too bad happened to you. Where with a crit failure, you messed up and bad things happened. Uh, the story guide gets, uh, one of the examples they had is you were fighting uh, next to a fire and you knocked over the like the little fire brazier and falls to the ground and starts setting the tent on fire. So something that, can happen, not something that punishes the player too much, they said, but something that adds a critical element to the story, may make the overall mission more difficult. Uh, it just kind of adds some of that tension to the story, which is always fun to have mechanics that support that. So. We went over the dice. So the dice, that's everything's with a D12. You get to roll these dice pools. You get to determine successes. Uh, now we're going to jump into encounters. Before we jump over fully into encounters, though, one of the cool things with the system is it's a little bit, uh, I'll say elegant in its simplicity on that side. Uh, because what the cool thing is, when you roll an attack, your attack rolls are skill checks. Uh, so you, when you build your skills, we went through that with Thuy Beta, uh, you go through and you determine kind of what skills they use. Uh, so with melee weapons, uh, you would have your melee weapon skill. Uh, you may even have a uh, uh, little specialization in it too. But you use those same things to roll and make the attacks, which we're going to go into as we go into the encounter. So just wanted to highlight that out. It's not like there's a separate attack roll or anything like that. It's all using those skill checks. So just keep that in mind as we go through the encounter. Uh, or kind of the combat section. So, first thing, when you're in combat, there's a couple of different things that change. First thing, and I, I, kinda, I think I like this part, is how they handle uh, initiative. I haven't, we haven't, we're going to play it tomorrow, so hopefully you can see me play it live and see if I like it, my players like it. But initiative's done very differently. So it's done through a score one through, or uh, numbers one through 12, so everything's 12 in the system. Uh, and with initiative, uh, the way that it's handled uh, is that your initiative score, you never roll for initiative, your initiative score is predetermined, it's on your character sheet, uh, and it's determined by the number of, uh, let me pull up a little notes here, uh, the number uh, of, so your agility plus perception plus charisma scores. So that equals your initiative number. Uh, so that's the number that you can choose for your initiative. So as we said, we don't roll it. But if initiative's called for, you guys get into a fight with some roving bands of bandits. Uh, the story guide says, hey, let's get initiative determined. 
you can use that number. So let's say uh, you get an initiative score of 10. You can pick any number between 1 through 10. And one of the cool things with this is they encourage you to converse with your other players uh, to determine their initiative scores. So you guys can kind of coordinate, say, hey, I want you to go first because you've got something that can help here. I'm going to go behind you. And within your initiative band, so that for our guy, he can go any number between 1 through 10. They can go through and pick their initiative that they want to go on. Uh, the story guide does the same for their NPCs, and they pick that initiative in secret. And then after the players have picked theirs or the DM has, or the story guide has picked theirs, the story guide reveals what all the initiatives were. So now with those, you can see they could have a score above 13. If you do have above 13, it just gives you some more freedom. So you can't go 13. You can't choose initiative 13. You have to do 12 as your highest. But it just gives you some more freedom so you can pick through there. And if you do have the higher initiative score, even if the story guide does have a monster with, uh, let's say that monster has a 12 initiative score. With that 13, you would still go before them. So, gives you some bonus benefits there, even if uh, it doesn't come into play. So, that's initiative. So, that's uh, just kind of get the, the fight going. Uh, just a little, uh, what I like about it is it allows you to kind of strategize with your team, gets that conversation flowing, which I've always think is nice. Uh, but after you get into the initiative, we're going to go over the core actions that you can take. Uh, so, with these two, there's a couple of core actions you can take. You got the primary and there's secondary actions. So primary are your big things. So making a skill check, and remember, your attacks are skill checks. Uh, so if you wanted to throw a tomahawk at somebody, you'd make that ranged, probably, ranged weapon attack. Uh, and uh, you, you kind of figure that out and determine if that's going to be a hit. Uh, also, you can activate abilities, perform secondary actions, uh, which we'll get into in a minute. You can delay your action or change your overall initiative score. Cool. So this is primarily what you're going to be doing on this. So this will be your main thing that you do for your turn. This will be how you change the tide of that encounter or battle or whatever is going on. Uh, but also you get secondary actions. Uh, secondary actions are smaller actions. Uh, you can only do one primary action on your turn. Uh, but you can do multiple secondary actions as long as they don't conflict with each other uh, and are reasonable. So this is something that your story guide can determine. Uh, and you can only do one of each type as well. Uh, so you can move, defend, take cover, dodge, reaction rolls. Uh, and we'll, unfortunately, we won't be able to go through what each of these secondary actions does today, but take a look through those. They've got some cool different actions and different ways you can change the environment as well. Uh, and then just some other things too, like uh, a lot of these kind of have some correlation with free actions from 5e, if you're familiar. Uh, you can reload or draw a weapon uh, that, uh, or uh, check a computer screen, flip a switch, speak to an ally, all of that. Uh, so these are pretty flexible, just small things you can do on your turn, uh, as well as some of the bigger options too, like moving, defending, taking cover, and dodging. So with your actions, uh, with a turn, you can take that one primary, as many secondaries as is reasonable, uh, and then kind of get that encounter flowing. So we've touched on that piece. Now we're going to go into making an attack. Uh, so making an attack is a big piece uh, for any TTRPG because you want to get into combat, you want to mix it up with some foes. Uh, and that's this is how you do that with County and Crow. So, same process, you'd roll your dice pool, but the difference here is the DM or the story guy does not determine the success number, the person's defense does. Now, with this system, there are three defenses. Typically, if you're making an attack, if it's going to be a physical damage, like you're shooting a bow, slashing somebody with an axe, it's going to be a base of their physical damage. But there are other ways to do mental and spiritual damage within the game as well. So with this, you're going to look at, take a look at that opponent. So let's say you're aiming with your bow and you shoot it uh, and you're rolling your dice pools. You have to have a number of successes higher than their physical defense. So if they have a physical defense of six, you need to roll six or more. Now, the good thing with this, uh, or the interesting thing with this, I should say, is once you do have that success, the number of successes you have is the damage they take to the stat. So for physical defense, the number of successes you would roll uh, is the amount of damage they would take to their body stat. So, uh, kind of interesting one, I thought about interesting kind of economy on that side. So the higher your defense is, is great, but also if you get you get hit, you're going to you're gonna feel it. Uh, so... Just kind of a cool piece of that. I thought that was interesting to me, at least. Uh, 
it just remember you have those three different stats. So if something's doing the physical damage, you minus physical damage, or you minus your, your body stat. If something's doing mental damage, you do it to your mind stat. Uh, if something's doing spiritual damage, you do it to your spiritual stat. Uh, so just keep those in mind as you're playing through the game. So, but that's easy. That was that was the attack and damage section. Uh, but we're gonna go into short rest before we wrap everything up, or we're gonna go into the rest section, I should say, before we wrap everything up, and just go a little bit about how rest are done. Cause I thought this is another interesting mechanic and kind of way that they handle it within the system. But similar to very uh, similar to five year, a lot of the big RPGs, you've got short and long rest. We're gonna touch on short first. Short rest. Uh, so with these. Uh, they can only be done right after an encounter has ended, and you can only do two per day. So it's not something like you can use some abilities in like RP or the storytelling section and say, hey, I want to take a short rest to get those back. They can only be done after an encounter, and you cannot do more than two per day. So keep that in mind. Uh, but after you do a short rest, one of the things you can do uh, is, let's say you got hurt a little bit, like uh, you've took a arrow to the chest, an arrow to the knee, uh, let's say, uh, and you, uh, your, your body is wounded, uh, you even took some spiritual damage in the fight. With the short rest, what you do is at the end of that short rest, you make three checks. Uh, and at the, with those three checks, uh, basically, it will be one for your endurance, using your endurance stat, one for your wisdom, one for your will stat. And what they correlate, endurance, body, wisdom, uh, mind, will, spirit. And with those, the number of successes you get for that stat is the number of points you can get back to the corresponding damage type. Or so endurance, if you roll that and you got three successes, you'd get three points back to your body, can't go above your maximum. Same thing with the wisdom and will for mind and spirit, respectively. So kind of a cool way to do that. Uh, I always like having, I like rolling dice and I encourage systems to have more dice rolls and this way you get to roll that in and get a little bit of extra back uh, after an encounter. So that's a short rest. Simple, easy, way to recover your stats. Now a long rest, you make those same checks. So you do endurance, wisdom, and will. Uh, same style with the number of successes equal the number of points you get back. Biggest difference too is you also gain points equal to what the stat is. So let's say you've got a five in endurance, you would gain five endurance points back on top of the number of successes you rolled uh, for that long rest. So it just gives you some cool options there. It just gives you some cool, uh, uh, cool ways to do that too. And I always like when they give you just kind of reflects the RP. Or reflect, I like when stats reflect what happens a little bit too. With 5e, it's sometimes a little bit of a this game break, uh, immersion breaking, I'll say, that you could be near death, but that lo little sleep gets you right back to full health, full abilities. This way, it kind of shows that your mental fortitude, your your strength of body and mind uh, help pump you back up and get you closer to being healthy or back to where you were before. So I thought that was cool. So, that was kind of like the major mechanics for this. It's a very in-depth and well-done system, but it's pretty simple. And I love that it has the one dice. I uh, like the dice pools, how everything's kind of coordinated together. Uh, and the stats, they're, they're all connected to, which we kind of went over with our character build section. And there's kind of a lot of things that flow well together, in my opinion. Uh, but that was just kind of a quick look through the mechanics. There are definitely more in-depth mechanics and more things in there that we didn't uh, get a chance to cover today. Uh, but I just want to give, give a little, little quick touch point on it, just a little quick something stuff to show you guys how it flows. But, so, we have went over the mechanics, we built a PC, we've touched our first impressions. Tomorrow is the day, guys. Join us, watch me and my players play through the Coyote and Crow system, have some fun slinging some D12s, uh, and get your chance to win a copy of the system. So make sure to join us at Tegan J Gaming on Twitch tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get in the game, get a chance to win, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to bring the system home to your crew. And even if not, you'll have some fun. My, my crew is always uh, good for a few laughs, if nothing else. Uh, so join us, and hopefully you'll have some fun. But thank you guys for attending. Uh, you got to watch this video on the mechanic side. Uh, and please, join us tomorrow, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Monday. See y'all later.